is smaller holder farmlands with specific crops for fieldy using TensorFlow library alongside satellite imagery, both optical and radar. She's currently working with a team that is identifying cashews in Berlin using the above mentioned technologies. So far, the model have on so far, the model they have created identifies cashews at 77% accuracy. My name is Lydia and I'm going to be discussing artificial intelligence. I'll be talking about some of the work that we've done so far and how we experience the unintelligent part of artificial intelligence. Currently, I am working with GeoGecko on a project called Fieldy Focus. The purpose of Fieldy Focus is to de-risk agribusinesses supply chains by quantifying crop acreage in smallholder dominated environments. So this means that as the ML engineer working on this project with the rest of the team, our role is to build those models which are going to be used to identify the crop acreage and yes. Mm, okay. Started our journey with machine learning last year. Uh, we're working on bananas and trying to identify banana crops in western part of Uganda. So we did that for some time and then we also got some data on maize and we did that as well. And early this year we were fortunate to get some data on cashew which we obtained from Radiant Earth. And this data is on what the locations of cashew farms in Benin. Our best data set so far was the cashew and when we worked with it uh, we created one of probably currently our best model with an accuracy of about 77 percent uh, we intend to also work with other crops like cotton and palm oil eventually we are working on sourcing the data and trying to then build the models around that okay now straight into the more interesting parts of the presentation we are going to talk about the mistakes that we actually made, the wrong assumptions that we had in the beginning and what we learned and how we moved on from those challenges that we experienced. So I will break this down into two groups. I'll first discuss um, our misunderstandings or our mistakes, our challenges uh, in regard to data and techniques. And then I'll also discuss it in regard to the ideologies behind machine learning. So first of all, as far as data is concerned, the biggest myth is the more data you have, the better the model that you're going to build. So we started thinking this as well. We were so excited. We got a certain data set that had over 7,000 points. So we were, we were very happy. We were ready to get our hands into it and start working. and get beautiful models but <laughs> so when we opened up the data which is i think like the first thing that happens is you receive the data everyone says the data is amazing um you read like the documentation of the data it looks beautiful you look through like some of the metadata it looks promising and then you open it up <sighs> so Points were not where points were claiming to be. There were problems with geolocation. Some of the locations were not as, I think, as accurate as the people who collected the data thought it was. We had points that were falling in the ocean. We had points that were claiming to be fields but were sitting on what was clearly urban area. So we ended up losing a lot of data and also it made us question the, the integrity basically of the data that we had. So it made us a bit skeptical to work with that particular data set and yeah, that's where the excitement died two weeks later. However, um, there are um, better sources of data out there that we've also been able to get that may not be as large but are properly sourced they are properly collected properly labeled and their locations which is probably one of the most important things is actually available 
so <clears throat> yes that brings me on to my next point which is all data is data um all data is not data because data um is highly dependent on what you want to use it for its importance if you are trying to build a machine learning model that's going to identify a particular curve and you have all these wonderful images the satellite images you have um, these polygons or fields but you don't have basic information like um, is this an intercropped field is this a monocropped field meaning in the case of the african context smallholder context there are farmers who carry out intercropping where they plant one crop with another crop within one farm so the spectral signature for that particular field is going to be different from the spectral signature of another field that is monocropped which is one crop in the field so if such distinctions are not made then we are going to be uh, mistraining our data and that's just going to lead into like uh, errors as you continue far along the modeling chain so all data is non-data some data is data uh, what is data it depends on what you need for our case we required that when we receive a data set it should have geolocation uh, at a bare minimum then it should be labeled in terms of what crops are being grown there and there should be details on whether it is monocropped or it is intercropped and also we need information on the growing seasons because also this ended up being a very big deal because across africa or of course i think the world but to speak for the context that i am quite certain of and none that i work in there are multiple seasons in different regions and those seasons vary from region to region so what would be a growing season in washi may be may not be a growing season in the next country so with that information we need to know at what point was this crop in the farm so if we have no information on when the crop was planted or when the crop was harvested then we do not know for what time period we should download the images yeah so so myth number three uh, you do not need to know the patterns and the trends in your data because there are algorithms that do this so in the beginning, we thought that we could get away without exploring our data properly because we had amazing algorithms that exist in TensorFlow that can help us to identify you know, the patterns in the data because there are those promises that are made. Unfortunately, um, there are certain things in your data that you have to find out for yourself. So with this, um, different crops have different behaviors um in regard to how they grow and how they manifest in the field yes so if you're to look at a perennial crop in comparison to say an annual crop the trends of values of its like spectral characteristics are going to be different so if you're trying to identify a perennial crop you need to know okay this perennial crop stays in the field for over let's say three years so i can get data for one year and analyze that for the entire year from the beginning of the year to the end of the year and then analyze that to try and define a trend however um, the same approach will not work if you're looking at a parent an annual crop sorry within your data set because if you're looking at a, an annual crop annual crops stay in the field for about three months sometimes four and then they're out so at that point you need to make sure that you you plan how you're going to handle your methodology basing on those patterns that exist in the data set that you're looking at that's also something that's very important that we also had to try and learn through the process also you'll notice that based on the different classes that you have the different classes are going to behave differently in terms of spectral characteristics um, if you look at classes like urban you look at classes like forest you look at classes like um 
bare land water they may be easy to differentiate but if now you bring a perennial crop and you're also looking at forest you need to study your data better to see what are the actual differences are there any differences between what is forest and what this particular annual crop is let's say if it is now like in our case of cashew cashew is a crop that is in the field the entire year um it's it's a bit it's also a bit dense biomass wise so how do you differentiate between that and other vegetation so things like that so if you look through the data that you have go through the trends and understand them yourself before you can actually implement all of this within the particular model that you've chosen to use so next after that you're going to look at the ideologies I, that model is the algorithm so for most people uh they feel if you choose the right algorithm you'll build the perfect model because if you have the perfect algorithm it's going to you know find the trends in the data properly if you have like the right method uh this is going to like this like tech wise this has been proven to be the best algorithm let's say you're going to use like a cnn model then you're going to like relu maybe adam and like details like that and you feel like those details are what make up the model i think with time we realize that that's not true because um as you build the model there's a lot more in that model that goes into the building of a proper model than just choosing the right algorithms you could have the best algorithms um because someone would say well i want to use like the nearest neighbor okay i want to use a uh, random forest i want to use you know whatever you want to use but what's the procedure to get into that point because before you get to selecting your model have you cleaned the data have you pre-processed your data to make sure that everything like is as it's supposed to be um, did you remove clouds or are some of your training data sets still clouds and these details are the things that actually end up feeding into your models either well performance or poor performance and i feel to an extent they may end up even being more important than which algorithm you have chosen because um, sometimes you can choose the best algorithms but if you're working with data that's not cleaned and processed as well as it should be then you're not going to achieve the levels of accuracy that you're looking for then the second ideology is the higher the accuracy, the better the model. Um, so in the beginning, when we started, we're aiming for you know the best accuracy possible, and you're thinking, well, I want to get like a ninety percent accuracy. So it's ah, uh, tweak this and tweak that. Let's get the accuracy higher. Uh, we still have the accuracy still at like sixty eight percent. I think we can do better. And you know, you get an accuracy. Let me say, at the time I had an accuracy of about. 88 percent was so excited <laughs> uh the level of overfitting that was within that model was insane um it was the accuracy was great because it was picking basically everything <laughs> and so uh since most of our training data was of the particular class that we were trying to identify it picked everything that we were trying to almost everything that we were trying to identify but it wasn't because it was properly differentiating between the different classes but it was just basically an over classification so when you get specific values of accuracy i think like at this point we scrutinize the accuracy a bit further especially if it is well, not too good to be true but a bit better than what you had anticipated basing on the data that you had 
so that has been something that we have had to learn but it, it's 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 quite exciting in the beginning when you get um a very high accuracy and you're ready to be done with that project and move on you're like yeah this is amazing um this is done i think we have like the best i don't know what this is i've been doing and then you get in the new testing data that the model hasn't yet seen <clears throat> and then um <laughs> Uh, you move on from 90% uh, accuracy to about 30% in the testing data because the model didn't, um, didn't perform as it was claiming to be performing. Another ideology is that simple models can perform just as well as complex models. So this one, I think um will ruffle some feathers because a lot of people still do believe that simple models can do what complex models can do um, especially given a lower quantity of data but in the work that we've done so in as i was saying previously we've worked with other crops like banana and maize and during that time our methodology was different from the methodology that we ended up implementing for the cashew so by that time we were using models built in scikit learn which um yeah I, I, okay so i i think you are aware of scikit learn so we're using some of those mod we're building the model from scikit learn using stuff like random forest and decision trees to to run the modeling and that went well for a while but uh, we were hitting a wall um with like okay a lot of cases of over classification we were looking at accuracies that we didn't really have a lot of ways to improve so at that point we considered um moving on to trying tensorflow since it was well like well documented quite talked about quite a lot so we moved into that into that and it actually ended up being a one of the better things that we did because with the scikit learn or scikit learn models we were not able to implement things like um the temporal aspect um temporal type of modeling so with tensorflow we had the opportunity to do that and instead of the model just uh basing on these data points as how do i say it we're able to analyze the data more in terms of the trends of the particular um, values for a particular class over time as opposed to looking at it in terms of a static one point in time um i don't know if that makes sense but um if you if if you look into it there are models that can better implement the temporal aspect of the data than others and as such we were able to find models of that nature when we moved to more complex models in tensorflow that we weren't able to do when we we're still working with scikit learn ideology number three <laughs> mistakes are to be avoided so i remember when we had just started we felt you know like press for time i want to get this done want to do it right however so the best way to do it is to make sure that you know we are doing things perfectly um i think for anyone who has done any work with um, machine learning or even just regular programming things don't go as um are planned initially especially if you're not aware of the way the full method works up to the end so we made a lot of mistakes and we <laughs> Because, or like, there are times, as I said, like, all these things that we've discussed have been the mistakes that we've made. Uh, not paying attention, that much attention to the data and focusing more on the model, 
thinking that the module is about the algorithm um, going ahead to make sure that we are achieving the best highest accuracy possible uh, without considering the other factors not looking at the trends within the data not studying uh, the actual characteristics of the particular crops that we are looking at or like the other classes that we are trying to study so these are the things that eventually like as you make the mistake and you fail then you go back and you try to rectify it so one of the biggest i think mantras that we go by at the office is you know if if it fails um we've learned something <laughs> so there's no fail because when it has failed at least we found one way that will not work so then we move on to find that way that will actually work and yeah so those are the mistakes that we made and those are the like myths that we thought we should bust yes so yes that is it so i wrote something that i thought would be a great way to end this conversation and i will just read it as was written um ml is an amazing technology it has great capabilities but also great potential for misinformation and we need to be responsible users of this technology by being open about its strengths but also it's just coming. Uh, thank you very much and I wish you all the best for the rest of Post4G. Uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask. Thank you. Bye. I have just a few questions that have been asked too. In particular, the first one is, do we have any published guidelines for the methodology or data collection plan? Unfortunately, we've not published our findings and for most of the guidelines that we are currently using, we've collected from multiple sources. So I can't really point to one particular resource but um, we are planning on putting something together that will discuss um, in detail the methodology or slash data collection plan. Um, second question is, are there model interpretability techniques you would recommend for data bugging? Um, so with this question, I think I, I do not follow it very well because right now what we are doing is as far as uh, performance of the models we are trying when we measure using the metrics that are available within the model we are working with we are trying to work hand in hand with actual like uh, clients who are giving us this data for the fields so then we can use data from the field to clarify if the model is performing as well as it's claiming to be performing on paper um, another question is have you tried Timnit, Gebru's model cards approach for documenting model intended use and shortcomings. No, actually I am just hearing of it now. So I think I'll note that. And yeah, uh, that, that would hopefully be a useful resource for us. Thank you.